on the monitor. We are technical, right? And uh, today's 11. Okay. All right. Thank you. Goodbye. All right. So, how's your life? Welcome to Dead Week. We made it. We're making it. I know I forgot something. Papers, but okay. We have time. So let's get to it. So, the uh, idea about organizing and the idea about studying history, because history isn't over, it's still happening. That's the me hidden message between what, uh, what goes around comes around, hidden within that. So, in 32, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was elected with 25% of the black vote, which is a shift, a historic shift away from Republicans, basically the party of Lincoln, which is what black people had traditionally voted for. Uh, basically to new, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the New Deal Democrats. Now what the New Deal was about was we had just, oh, we were still essentially in the midst of the Great Depression as a country and somewhat to, to the degree that, uh, it ha that America influences the rest of the world, the rest of the world is also in depression. So when you're in depression, certainly in, a, in drug terms, when somebody is suffering from the mental illness of depression, what do they treat it with? Antidepressants, Antidepressants which are usually as a drug class, what? Psychotropics. They are psychotropics, yes, but if you're depressed, Drugs. And, what, and you want to get up, Speed, stimulus, right? Hence, remember with Obama, the stimulus, right? Designed to bring us out of the depression. Hmm, how's that working? <laughs> Not so well, huh? Well, in this case, there are other places that are going through similar things, and when people are feeling in desperate situations, they will listen to anybody that claims to have an answer without checking out whether the answer will actually work. Not so much slamming FDR, but I'm thinking like Hitler. Right? So anybody who sounds like a leader, people may follow unless they have the wherewithal to question them. Yeah, see what sticks. All right. So, so the New Deal Democrats, which are different than Dixiecrats. The Dixiecrats historically were not only pro-slavery, but also pro-segregation. Because they were the Democrats in the South. So that's kind of reflected in our Eugene history, too. Where... The idea of Oregon becoming a free state was not to not have, just to not have slavery, but to also forbid black people from coming. And that was kind of a Republican idea, but the Southern Democrat idea in Southern Oregon was to create a pro-slavery half of Oregon. Now, it never got off the ground, but the conservatism of South Douglas County and South is well known. Democrat or Republican, don't matter, right? So in one sense, it's not just a whole yeah. Occupy paranoia that the Republicans and the Democrats are essentially the same thing. There are differences, but there are some similarities in terms of who they're willing to exploit. 
And that dates back kind of to this time. So we got to organize one way or the other. Compared to Hoover's Depression era policies, Roosevelt seemed like a better idea. I don't know if you are old uh, television series buffs, but you know, all in the family. Okay, when he's talking about we could use a guy like Herbert Hoover again. If Archie Bunser, Bunker likes that president, you should be suspicious. Or not so suspicious, just, just note that. All right? So the switch essentially brought, brought the first Democratic, first black Democratic congressman, Arthur Mitchell. So this actually appears on the final somewhere near you. Just note that name and note that switch. Now, if you're going to join the winning party, there's going to be some compromises, always. So that's why you should always make sure that you are organized enough amongst yourself within your own household and among the folks that you consider allies to get things done on your own. Because you might not be able to depend on elected officials to do those things. All right, so 36. Blacks gave FDR 52% of the vote. However, those New Deal policies still gave least to blacks who needed it most. So just because you get a victory and get your guy in the White House does not mean those policies will necessarily trickle down to benefit you. Just saying. That's the way to vote, but voting in your guy might not necessarily be the entire solution, so don't necessarily count on it. Many of my colleagues feel that I'm too cynical about that. I'm too anti-system. Not anti-system, just realist about what the system will do for you. Don't trust them. If they're not going <laughs> to act for you, don't trust them to do that. All right. And critically, FDR didn't challenge the South's clear violations of the U.S. Constitution, those particularly which gave the black, blacks equal citizenship. Even more critically, of course, he's a war, he was a wartime commander-in-chief. He did nothing to... Re, you know, when lynching was going on in American soil, didn't speak out against it. Not only just lynching, but lynching of American servicemen. In the streets of New York City, Roosevelt didn't say a word. All right, so where we live, that is African Americans, uh, if you're not going to talk about stuff that's blatantly illegal, blatantly horrific, what good are you? Well, there's some good, right? But if the Constitution guaranteed us by law equal citizenship and you're letting the South get away with that, well, you're of limited value, okay? So New Deal, Democrat, but same old, same old. Racism still exists. No matter what the law says, that pesky Constitution, skin privilege will neither be abridged nor eliminated. Now, the only place that... <clears throat> Skin privilege has actually explicitly been eliminated within a constitution is the current South African regime. But they ain't got the money to pull off those provisions. That's currently. Back here, there's still apartheid. So, what do we do with the power we have? So, as an example... One of the clear things, if, if in Latin the word for voice is vote, certainly you vote with your dollars. Okay? So the buying power movement is one response you have. So with buying power, how much does power cost and how much have you got? So last week when I talked about thinking about what your net worth is, even at this game, 
stage of the game. What is your net worth? And what is your buying power? Do you spend money with people that have your best interests at heart? Or if you go to Walmart because it's cheap, have you ever been followed or rousted by security and accused of ripping stuff off because of your excellent suntan? That has happened in the local Walmart. You might question their labor practices. Yeah, and you might question their labor practices too. Right. So, how much does power cost? How much have you got? Could you make an alliance with people that have your interest at heart? Spend your money with those who respect you and those who hire you. Is a good start, because back then, job discrimination was legal. So they would basically talk about that, and urban and, urban and rural blacks would basically organize buying power clubs as well as co-ops. And remember, we had started our own banks and insurance companies and other things. Learn how money works and organize within your own community to move towards your economic interests, whatever those are. Because you remember last week, if the Ku Klux Klan is saying, spend your money with Americans, if they're doing that, who do you think they're buying from? I mean, it's a, their own equivalent of the buying power movement. Walmart. <laughs> they might be, yeah. They might be spending their money with Walmart. Or, you know, you can create your own food co-op or whatever it is you want to do. All right? So, if these people don't hire you, take direct action with picket lines, boycotts, demonstrations. Because one thing, one thing you can count on a corporation to do, they will definitely act to protect the bottom line. And they don't like negative press. Right? Or you can also take action with arts, too, which is also another um, strategy. The thing with taking action with art is you may be able to express your pain, but people will, may not be able to hear your message as directly. They have to understand where you're coming from, which is okay if, you know, you're speaking to an artistic community. Okay? Create your own systems, too. So, Marian Anderson was an American contralto and one of those, the most celebrated singers of the 20th century. She possessed a rich and vibrant voice with intrinsic quality of beauty. Most of her singing career was spent performing in concert and recital in major music venues with major orchestras throughout the U.S. and Europe between 25, around the Harlem Renaissance, and 1965. So Contralto gives you, the fact that she even has that designation gives you an idea of some of the um, types of things that she does, not only classic, but Negro spirituals. There's stuff on, uh, of hers available on iTunes. Uh, there, let's see, there's one of my favorite things of hers is an old hymn, um, there's no hiding place. I went to the rock to hide my face, and the rock cried out, no hiding place. There's no hiding place down there. All right? She also made a concert stop in Salem, but couldn't stay in the hotels there. So, usually... Um, there's a slide missing here. So, for example, the Daughters of the American Revolution. Basically, if you understand who the <laughs> DAR is, Daughters of the American Revolution was a group of older white women who did not let black people into their organization, even though black people fought in the revolution. 
they were not going to let Marian Anderson sing in their music hall. Because she was black. So, they refused to let her sing, so their race-driven refusal placed her in the spotlight of the international community on a level usually only found by high-profile pro high celebrities. The president and the first lady, Anderson, performed a critically acclaimed open-air concert on Eastern Sunday in 1939 on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial to a crowd of more than 75,000 people and a radio audience in the millions. There being no television then. I don't know if you can even imagine a world with no TV. <coughs> Probably your children, oh yes, you can. Okay? Can your children even imagine a world without the internet? Or cell phones? <laughs> All right, later, she became an important symbol of grace and beauty during the Civil Rights <coughs> Movement and the 60s, seeing on the march in Washington in 63. She was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 63, the Kennedy Center Honors in 78, National Medal of Arts in 1984, and a Lifetime Grammy in 91. So eventually she did get her props. So grace under fire as an artist. My man, Paul. So there was, um, I don't know if we'll ever be able to broadcast it. I did see that uh, the, the play that happened here this, uh, at the college this weekend uh, by Dr. Stan Coleman playing uh, Paul Robeson. Paul was an athlete, scholar, lawyer, singer, activist who spoke 46 languages and performed in 25 <coughs> of those languages. Right? Made a brief stop in Eugene. So, as an activist, um, he was active in civil rights, labor rights, and uh, was quite outspoken, to say the least. So, he agitated actively. This is my standard of reference for what a black athlete is, pretty much. Performance on the field is one thing. Liberating your people is another. So, most of his life, he is advocating for equality. So, not only his uh, baritone voice and grand presence, but magnificent performances on stage and screen. His outspokenness, of course, caused him some difficulties. He basically didn't uh, deviate from it. Of his time, he was probably one of the most famous and celebrated, and is this the first time you've ever heard of him? Yeah. Okay. Hmm, you should question that. <laughs> you should still question that. All right. Socialist. Yes, he was a socialist like a lot of folks, but never a member of the Communist Party for fairly decent reasons. His father was an escaped slave who uh, eventually graduated, who freed himself at 15, gradually, eventually graduated from Lincoln College, and his grandfather was a slave who was freed by a second owner and went on to become an active member of the African Free Society. It's basically uh, one of the early abolitionist groups. Between 34 and 37, performed in several films that presented blacks in other than stereotypical ways. Sanders of the River, King Solomon's Mind, Song of Freedom. He often played in his movie roles dis, um, uh, African prince who was displaced and living among whites. And part of his 46 languages is whenever he was portraying a particular African tribe, he'd learn that tribe's language so they could speak it credibly on film. On a trip to the Soviet Union, 
to discuss the making of the film Black Majesty. He had discussions with the Soviet film director Sergei Eisenstein, but was so impressed regarding the education against racism for school children that he began to study Marxism and socialist systems in the Soviet Union. In fact, there was another experience before he actually, um, he and his wife, who was the first black female pathologist in history, um, they were traveling uh, through Germany on their way to Moscow for a concert tour, and the Nazis pulled them off the train because they thought his wife was white. And then he went from there to Moscow, where um, he got a different treatment. And one of the things that he actually was quoted as saying is that he had never felt an area as free of race prejudice in the United States as he did in Russia. So he decided to send his son to school in the Soviet Union so that he would not have to contend with the racism and discrimination he dealt with, with that his father dealt with in Europe and America. Because imagine, how can you get an ant could you get an anti-racist education in American schools in the 1930s, or 40s, or 50s, or 60s? <laughs> yeah. All right. So while this led to charges that he was a communist, he never actually joined the party, you know. But. He basically did notice, especially when the Nazis pulled him off the train, that there was definitely a connection between the Nazis in Germany and the Klan in America. More than kissing cousins. Him shaking hands with uh, Du Bois. I've been reading this book um, that I just got from um, actually Amazon and also Lance Sparks. This one line really struck me. It's in uh, The World in Africa, and uh, he, Du Bois wrote this in basically 46, post-war, uh, describing part of the world we'll be looking at either late this term or early next term. The syllogism of the satisfied. This cannot be true. This is not true. If it were true, I would not believe it. If it is true, I do not believe it. Therefore, it is false. So he's talking about in terms of, you know, the reaction to good people to say, to, to the presenting them facts that your freedom has been bought on the oppression of a lot of people and is currently going on in terms of oppressing a lot of people. You might want to change that and look at it. So, Robeson with Einstein. So a lot of people don't necessarily know that Einstein, yes, it was a genius, but he was a fervent anti-racist. Two. So, he sent an Einstein a letter proposing the creation of the American crusade to end lynching. He supported him. He did send a letter to President Harry Truman, asking him to draft an anti-lynching law. The assail bill was turned down. But in the process, the FBI submitted a 12-page report on Einstein because of his association with Robeson. Wait, this guy just gave you the bomb and suggesting that maybe racism against American soldiers is like treason? And he's a communist? Wow. Okay. Hmm. Now, he's a genius, right? So, you can't, and like I've said before, you cannot assume that just be, that racists are stupid. You cannot assume that. But it's obvious that a genius would be anti-racist. But not all geniuses are anti-racist. 
This is his answer to a question on racism posed by a rabbi. A human being is part of the whole, called by us the universe, limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings, as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a prison, restricting us to our personal desires and affection for a few persons close to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from our prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all humanity and the whole of nature and its beauty. Nobody's able to achieve this completely, but the <coughs> striving for such achievement is in itself part of the liberation and a foundation for inner security. Now, if this is, your, if this is a genius's answer to how do you deal with racism, how would you put that in your terms? What do you get from this? Okay, we're all important. The notion of being different is not there. Say again. The notion of being different as a human being is not there. It's right. Different. It's separate. You know, separation is itself an illusion. I mean, he's speaking from a quantum physics point of view, which basically says, look, you're connected. Your cell phones run on this principle. Right? Cell phones are quantum devices. There's a connection on a very basic level. Right? The separation is an illusion. So, self-knowledge helps you overcome some degree of separation. Because the racists don't see you as part of themselves. Denying that connection. This doesn't mean you necessarily have a kumbaya with people who are a kumbaya moment, but you can still understand that they are connected even though they don't see it. And you can see that accurately, whether they are connected, whether, whether they see that connection. So, the striving by itself is part of the liberation. So, so, so this is also hidden. Race prejudice has unfortunately become an American tradition which is uncritically handed down from one generation to the next. The only remedies are enlightenment and education. This is a slow and painstaking process in which all right-thinking people should take part. Einstein even took every opportunity to stand up for what he thought was right. In 37, he stepped in when the African-American opera star Marion Anderson was refused a room at Princeton's Nassau Inn, he invited her to stay at his home, which she did. And from then on, she stayed with him whenever she visited Princeton, New Jersey. Marion kicking it with Albert. Hey. So, another freedom movement. When I was talking about with the arts, so not just Anderson and Robeson, and to some extent, Albert Einstein. Bebop was then what hip-hop is now. The difference being that there is an anti-intellectual strain within hip-hop. People want to be rappers instead of readers, even if it's their own stuff. And jazz musicians are masters of their instruments, actual instruments, not turntables or recordings. Which I'm not saying you can't play samples. But it's actually better to have the skill with an instrument, too. If rappers could program in hexadecimal, or any programming language that programs their computers and their samplers, etc., that would be different. But they don't. So that means they're using technologies that they couldn't build from scratch themselves. So if the technology collapsed, where are they? All right, so. Bird, Charlie Bird, Yard, Bird Parker, <coughs> Dizzy Gillespie, Bud Powell. So Bach was the hip hop of its day, considered radical, subversive, but highly intellectual and demanding. 
requiring a recondite ethic, which of necessity meant one had to master music theory as well as one's instruments, real instruments. So I'm a jazz musician, guitar player, singer. Look, learn your scales, learn the basic fundamentals, then branch out. Read. Two. Woodshed. Yeah. <clears throat> want to explain that reference? Do you want me to explain that? Yeah. Yeah, I can. Charlie Parker. Yeah. When he locked himself in a uh, saxophone is a B flat instrument, and uh, it's hard to convert to other in other instruments. Right. So he would. He locked himself in the shed and learned how to play scales in every key, even though you very rarely play those other keys, and that's what made him so great. Yeah. Yeah, and you can hear that in his tone. But right, a B flat instrument. Right, being able to play scales, and you know, you also hear that in Train's music, where, excuse me, John Coltrane, and also his son Ravi Coltrane, is taken up where <coughs> his parents left off. But uh, John would often play in modal keys and tones too. Few giants of bebop. Max Roach, Coltrane, Charlie Mingus, Thelonious Monk, Sonny Rollins, Miles Davis. Thelonious Monk could play, uh, what's it called? Two scales at one time. You know, and make it sound poly good. Polyrhythms. Yeah. He's probably the greatest keyboard player ever. The Duke of Ellington. So, tradition and innovation. So, jazz is uh, African music played on European American instruments with some modifications. So, for example, drummers. We invented trap drums. They're basically a modification of drums that came from Africa, along with cymbals, which are also made in Africa. And uh, the first time that this was made in the eighth, uh, 19th century, what is that contraption? And that tra contraption was an invention called trap drums. So while Duke had actually did say his music is American music rather than jazz, it's jazz. Because it had to do with creating something out of nothing and then playing in a traditional uh, style or become traditional. All right, so jazz musicians, of course, were considered subversive because of some of the things that they were saying and the things that they were playing, too. Basically, coded message about liberation and equality, etc. So they're often targeted for persecution by the police, <coughs> the FBI, and others. So, as I said, don't think that racists are stupid. Not all of them are. Just ignorant. Yeah. So, but there are some that are well educated and also products of their education. So, they are capable of creating elaborate systems of deception and oppression. So, for example, the easiest way to lie is to tell the truth, but not all of it. So, as an example. So, they may, some may be ignorant, but you cannot be, afford to be ignorant in fighting them. So, one of the ways they fight best is by keeping information away from you, some of which we've tried to reveal here. All right? History to a people is like memory to a person. Hide the history, you hide possibilities. So with the depression during this time going global, times being uncertain, weak and fearful minds go for simple solutions from anyone who sounds like they know what they're doing and can drive a wedge between citizens instead of creating unity. Okay, the easiest way to lie is to destroy connections with people and the historical connections with people. 
make them afraid of their allies and trust you. This goes back to the whole Willie Lynch letter. Except they dress it out and bring it up in other ways. So where I'm going with this, need to get out of depression, start a war. Oh, yeah, and we're in a war. <laughs> we're still in the oh, recession. So with money pouring into defense industry creating jobs, who should we go to war against? Japan, Germany, who are we likely to ally with? The country of people of color or... Right? If there are issues of race, who will we align with? And just who is the we? Depends on what we need for resources. Ah, right. Oppressed yeah, people. and and who is the we? Oppressed people. Oppressed people. Well, that's a, one easy way. But in the preamble to the Constitution, we the people. What who is the we? Hmm, who is the we? So hold that thought for a second. United States corporate law. Uh oh. I'm going there. So corporations have the same rights as human individuals. Property is protected as well as free speech rights. A company is forbidden to engage in any activity that does not return a profit to shareholders, even if that activity is in the common good for human beings. Did I do social math with you yet? Oh, what is social math, Ben? You sure? Okay, let me show you something. We live in a country where the golden rule provides, it, them that got the gold makes the rules, right? So if U.S. corporations are the ones that got the gold, right? And the Constitution or the Supreme Court has made a decision not just in Citizens United, but before, in the 19th century. Corporations are people. Right? So way before Occupy, people were actually trying to work against this. So I'll give you a blatant example. Have you heard me say every day legal drugs kill more people than died at 9-11? I've heard that before. Yeah. I'm not sure that. Every day legal drugs kill more people than died at 9-11. And these are, these are not murders, these are not car crashes, these are using the drugs the way the manufacturers intended. The FDA's got the coin. It's not just the FDA. So for example, if you, you took the example of the uh, Environmental Protection Agency. That is a regulatory organization created by the federal government, created by a set of laws to control pollution, and the people that are represented on the EPA are, in fact, the polluters themselves. Okay? Who made certain rules that say, okay, if they know that a substance is poisonous, the FDA cannot ban that substance unless it has the money to buy up all the existing stocks of that substance. First. Notice who made those rules. The company don't necessarily have to clean it up. The government has to clean it up. And they can only do that if they have the money to clean it up. That's a double bind. Hmm. You think? <laughs> you think? That's just one example of corporate influence in terms of, you know, U.S. power. So... I deal with addiction stuff, right? So, let's say that 3,000 people a day die from legal drugs. Name some legal drugs. Or actually, I'll just tell you. Oxycodone. 
Let's see. In terms of pharmaceuticals, that's 100,000 people a year. This is using the year 2000 stuff. Okay, so the year 2000 statistic, the rate was like about 3,000 people a day. So total, it was 750,000 people who died from legal drugs. From illegal drugs, 14,000 people. Okay? So if you broke it down, and here's what I mean by social math. That's a big number, right? So it's different depending on which drugs you're talking about. It's segmented. So just to give you the image, if you worship the tobacco god... The equivalent of three fully loaded 747s crashed every day just in smokers. Suppose you weren't a smoker. One 727 crashing every day from secondhand smoke. You're Alcohol. Not, you're not including tobacco in that figure. Tobacco is in that figure. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah, but I'm breaking it, breaking it down by drug. So social math basically takes a big number like that. Let's divide it into a number that you can understand. Because, all right, that's three quarters of a million people. That's how I get the 3,000 people a day. All right? So what that breaks down to is for smokers, active smokers, three 747s crashing every day. For passive smokers, one 727 crashing every day. For alcohol, that's 100. Alcohol is 150,000 people in that year. That's one L1011, or you could also say a 1757 crashing every day. 100,000 for big pharma. So think Heath Ledger. Okay? Nailed that role as the Joker in the Batman movie, but it twisted his head. So he couldn't go to sleep, so he got you know, three different medications, which killed him. The combination killed him. And he wasn't a drug addict. But 100,000 people died that year from prescription. So he put it all together, boom. In order to get that 14,000 figure... Is NyQuil up in there? Sure. But NyQuil's over the counter, but yeah. Sure, yeah. Legal drugs use the way the manufacturer intended. Now, the reason I point this out and went on this whole thing about corporate power, you don't have to raise your hands to answer this, but how many of you waited till you were 21 to drink? Hmm. It is illegal for you to drink in the United States under 21. It is not illegal for them to market to you. Got that? They know from drug prevention literature, we know that if you haven't started using alcohol, tobacco, or other drugs addictively by the time you're 15, you ain't gonna. Chances are you ain't gonna. So, in order, so they know that people are dying from using their drugs the way people in, they intended. So what they do is they need you strung out by 15. That's so like middle high school. Yeah. Middle, yeah, like early high school. Yeah. So what they do is they push binge drinking on you and tobacco use on you because your nervous systems haven't developed enough so that you're more addictable. So, figure it out. In advertising, in the year 2000, they spent 10 billion US, obviously, advertising alcohol and tobacco products in the year 2000. At the same time, the government spent 1 billion on prevention and treatment. 
Guess who's going to win? All right, this is an example of corporate power versus the government's ability to regulate it and how it affects you, and you think that's normal. Well, that has become normal. Okay, so go back to slide. Company is forbidden to engage in any activity that is not pervert for return of profit to shareholders, even if that activity is in the common good. So for PR purposes, a company can say, oh, drink responsibly. They can say that only if that activity does not decrease their profit, which means in a drug prevention context, the drug dealers, and by that me, I mean RGR Nabisco, or Altria, excuse me, Anheuser-Busch, Seagram's, they can push their addictive product, and any PR they do to make sure, oh, we're good guys, has to be ineffective. By law. <laughs> they can't engage in something that would, you know, if every person between the ages of 8 in a and 80 years old, so 8-year-olds can't drink, right, legally? If every person between the ages of 8 and 80 in the United States drank 4 alcoholic drinks a week, only 4, alcohol consumption would drop 40%. Okay, so if you didn't drink four drinks this week, somebody's drinking your share. <laughs> I'm not suggesting you catch up, obviously. <laughs> I'm just saying, understand why they do what they do in terms, and this is very basic healthcare, you know? Basically, all our alcohol problems come from overdoses, and that overdose is also basically promoted by an advertising climate that makes overuse normal. Certainly if you ate a bottle of aspirin, we would see that as a suicide attempt. How come we don't see that with a fifth of vodka or a case of beer? <laughs> it's what they do. So I'm just giving you one example of how corporate power affects your life or those around you. Back to slide, thank you. Hey, uh, yeah. how many people a year does McDonald's kill? Oh, wow. You don't even want me to get into yeah, induced... <laughs> More than most wars. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, the corporation is not bound to the same ties of loyalty a citizen is. From heart disease. Yeah, from heart disease. And addiction to junk food. Yeah. yeah. Seems super size, but damn. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so companies can do business with the enemy if it is profitable. So the timing, the reason that this is the, I'm describing current conditions, these current conditions had their roots in this time period that we're looking at. All right, corporations, companies can do business with the enemy if it's profitable. They can damage the environment or engage in activities that may harm or do harm human beings unless they are found to be negligent, it's perfectly legal. Yeah. Yeah. But right. in some places it is. It's true. Is that how it's written? Negligence? Mm hmm. That can be an interpreted word. Mm hmm. Perfect. Mm hmm. Companies can engage in activities which result in the death of human beings, which you, if you engage in it, it'd be murder. Mm 